Our next speaker is Daniel Holzbosch, who is the Charles Seligson Professor of Law and Affiliated Professor of History here at New York University. He was educated at Colgate University, earned a JD at Columbia and a PhD from Harvard. He's the author of Constituting Empire, New York and the Transformation of Constitutionalism in the Atlantic World, 1664 to 1830, which won both the John Philip Reed Prize of the American Society for Legal History and the Littleton Griswold Prize of the society whose conference we are attending today. He's the author also, uh, or in working on an, uh, a new project now, it's been going on I think for a few years with a colleague of his at NYU, David Golov. Um, they published, uh, uh, at least especially in uh, uh, legal academic circles, an enormously interesting and important article together in 2010, A Civilized Nation, the Early American Constitution, the Law of Nations, and the Pursuit of International Recognition. And they continue to work on a, a book together with the quite uh, important, I think, provocation to the American legal academy and profession to be thinking about our Constitution and its creation in the terms of the international valences in which it came to be. Uh, more recently, he's uh, just published, I, I think it just came out uh, in recent days or weeks, uh, in the Suffolk uh, Law Review, the revolutionary portfolio, Constitution Making in the Wider World in the American Revolution, which reads as something as a prologue to that last article I mentioned. So reading those two articles together, I, I really recommend to people as enormously stimulating for uh, pulling American constitutional analysis out of its uh, typical national frame. Nonetheless, I think all of this work then sets up very nicely uh, the paper that Dan will give to us today, Magna Carta for the World, the Constitutional Protection of Foreign Subjects in the Age of Revolutions. Please welcome Dan Hulsbosch. So you know, in law schools, we love our uh, oppositions, antinomies. So one we use is uh, law in the books, law in action. Um, so maybe that's what uh, that's the the uh, path we're going to travel here from like the myth in the books to the myth in, a, in action. In other words, I'm going to take you into the weeds, and I apologize for that in advance. But um, in the early 1790s, the U.S. Supreme Court tried a case between the state of Georgia and a foreign British merchant who had lent money to a colonist before the American Revolution. The creditor named Brailsford wished to collect that 20-year-old debt and sued his debtor directly. The Treaty of Peace provided that neither side would place impediments in the way of debt collection. Despite its formal equality, everyone knew that this was a, not a one-way, this really was a one-way provision. Uh, Americans owed millions to British creditors, not so much the other way around. Um, Georgia, on the other hand, argued that during the revolution, it had confiscated all the debts of British, uh, uh, owed to British creditors by Georgians. Um, and confiscations completed during the war, it argued, didn't fall under the treaty provision uh, preventing uh, or, or knocking down impediments uh, to the collection of debt. Uh, they, he, instead, they were thinking, Georgia argued, of paper money, installment plans, prohibitions on foreigners suing in courts, that sort of thing. Therefore, it owned the debt, and if it hadn't collected it already, then the debtor ought to pay it to the Georgia Treasury. Now, a case between a British creditor and American state starting in 1791 seems an unlikely place to find Magna Carta, but there it is. The parties debated Chapter 30 of Magna Carta, um, which guaranteed two rights to foreign merchants, free entry and exit during peacetime without being subjected to unusual taxes, and in wartime, the promise that their person and goods would be unharmed uh, unless their own king had attacked and confiscated British merchants in that enemy kingdom. In other words, no harm to enemy merchants uh, except in retaliation, tit for tat. Now this idea that reciprocity was a fundamental mechanism in international relations became something like uh, a social science axiom in the 18th century enlightenment. It was central to the Supreme Court case uh, the participants' reading of Magna Carta, and many Americans' understanding of their federal constitution. The Attorney General, for example, argued that Chapter 30 stood for the proposition that the faith of commercial intercourse ought not to be violated. 
What was at stake was not just past promises. The vindication of old debt contracts would ensure what he called the prospect of future credit. The treatment of old debt would signal to creditors across the Atlantic that in the U.S. credit was safe. Several lawyers and judges invoked the second part of Chapter 30, in part, the part protecting foreign mer merchants during, uh, from expropriation during wartime, to help find that Georgia, despite what Georgia claimed, had not actually confiscated British debts during the war. Now, international creditors didn't have votes in America. Instead, the lawyers and judges argued, the Constitution gave them rights. Those rights, not direct political participation, were presented as the source of Americans' credible commitment to repay debts. So the roots of American stringency about Amer uh, international debt run deep, and they began at home. And so did the American fascination with rights. And reasons for both came partly from the medieval charter. At least, the early American interpretation of Chapter 30 offers in insights about how that section had been glossed in the Enlightenment and about how Federalists in particular used it as a lens through which to view the legal protection of international credit. Now, no one argued that Magna Carta was good law. Instead, it provided some context for interpreting Georgia's revolutionary confiscation statute. The Treaty of Peace, uh, in addition, uh, was enlightened by Chapter 30 and the constitutional supremacy of international treaties above state law as well. As Supreme Court Justice uh, James Iredell put it when holding in favor of the British creditor, Magna Carta is dear to all friends of liberty in which our ancestors and those of the present inhabitants of Great Britain had a common participation and which in many of its parts we cherish with the highest veneration. Now Magna Carta, as we've already heard it earlier, become uh, part of imperial con constitutional myth. Colonists had invoked it when pro proclaiming the principles of no taxation without representation and trial by jury. Now, after political separation, that transatlantic myth still informed American constitutional argument. It shaded the interpretation of an obscurely written uh, revolutionary statute, giving the court some authority for bending the law away from Georgia's immediate fiscal interest and toward international credit for the whole nation. The upshot was that a British creditor could collect from his American debtor, and if Georgia had already collected debts from Georgia debtors, perhaps Georgia, uh, uh, the British creditors could sue Georgia as well. So two aspects of this use of Magna Carta in the 1790s uh, interest me. First, Magna Carta not only escaped England into the British Empire, it escaped the empire into the post-colonial United States. And second, and even more interesting, Magna Carta was never uh, solely concerned with the rights of Englishmen, imperial subjects, or even Americans. From the beginning, it had contained some rights for foreign merchants, aliens in the term of the day. Most, legal, uh, most historians, I think, can begin to intuit how Americans grabbed hold of the medieval charter and tried to make it their own. But how exactly did aliens enter the picture? And the bare fact that an article in Magna Carta, often portrayed as the birthright of native Englishmen and then somehow Americans, and a cornerstone of the English Constitution, actually speaks to the rights of foreigners is significant. And that it was glossed by Enlightenment thinkers like Montesquieu and Blackston, and that the chapter played a supporting or at least cameo role in de the development of early American constitutionalism is especially intriguing. And I'll focus on that story, the endurance and subtle transformation of the merchant's chapter, and concentrate especially on how Americans invoked it in the early republic. But I also want to suggest some larger claims that I'm working out uh, in a book with a colleague about the international dimensions of uh, early, early American constitutions. And for a long time, constitutional history has read like the authorized biography of the nation. Uh, the story of uh, the protagonist rarely leaves home except when provoked and not a lot of people seem to visit. Um, it's our argument that the American constitutions don't fit the dominant myth of constitution making. They were from the beginning diplomatic instruments. Uh, most constitutions do of course mark boundaries of inclusion and membership, but many constitution makers range more broadly. And one remarkable feature of what uh, David Armitage and Linda Colley call the contagion of constitution writing in the generation or so after 1776 is that constitution makers in many places openly debated the degree to which their constitutions ought to protect foreigners uh, 
particularly foreign merchants and creditors. It goes too far to call the right of international creditors to, uh, to get repayment the first human right. But I'll just throw it out there to rouse people at the end of a long day at a conference. Uh, commerce was a fundamental issue for constitution makers and their constituents in the age of revolutions. That was especially true in revolutionary states formed by imperial civil war. My focus is on the US, but there were similar debates yielding very different institutional configurations later in Haiti and Latin America. There were also related debates over the political role of commerce in revolutionary France and its serial constitutions. And once you begin to think about the Enlightenment context for the outburst of written constitutions and the centrality in the Enlightenment of questions of political economy or the relationship between political structure and economic development in what contemporaries already saw as an international economy, it makes sense that constitution makers debated how to promote and channel international commerce. And the federal constitution in particular shot through with provisions designed to integrate the US into the larger world of European states, including uh, transatlantic credit, taking away all the foreign affairs powers from the states, disabling them from issuing paper money or interfering with future contracts. The peace treaty covered old contracts, uh, making the peace treaty supreme law of the land, giving the federal courts jurisdiction over cases involving aliens and foreign states, these are just some of the international provisions in the 1787 document. And in one of those alien cases brought just a few years later, um, the Supreme Court invoked Magna Carta to frame a debatable interpretation of a state law. The sum, of these, uh, the sum total of these clauses and their glosses cast doubt on the proposition that the federal constitution was designed to create a so-called fiscal military state like those in Europe it would be better characterized as a fiscal commercial state. Now in the longer version, I start to sketch the picaresque journey of the foreign merchants chapter uh, over time and in the historiography. But today, let me just pick up during the English Civil War with the posthumous publication of Sir Edward Cook's book length translation and gloss on Magna Carta, as Linda Colley's already mentioned, the Second Institutes. Um, for a writer so long charged with intellectual parochialism, Cook's treatment of chapter 30 is surprisingly Catholic. Recall that the first part of chapter 30 guaranteed free entry and passage for foreign merchants without unpredictable taxation. Um, but of course, merchants were subject to prospective regulation, as uh, Cook noted. The second part dealt with the status of these foreign merchants. If their home country went to war against England, they would be safe at least it was until it was found out what was happening to English merchants abroad. So Cook extended the reciprocal dynamic of the second right, the wartime right, to the peacetime right to be free of arbitrary taxes. And it's a surprisingly sociable move uh, for a jurist so long associated with jealous concern for England and aversion to everything continental. It's a kind of realist sociability. He didn't write of the natural affinity of humans or the peace-promoting qualities of commerce. Instead, he assumed that trade was a good thing because it increased wealth for the nation. An effective way to increase it was to permit foreign merchants into England. The reputation of England's openness would be reported abroad and encourage reciprocation. Now, nations could get that sort of reciprocation directly through treaty negotiations, but Cook was suggesting that we could induce it indirectly by lowering trade barriers, as it were, for foreign merchants, and therefore encouraging foreign uh, kingdoms to do the same. So he was groping toward freer, if not free trade, and he argued that legal liberties within, within England, even for aliens, could benefit Englishmen at home and abroad. Greater wealth, greater freedom to trade elsewhere. So commercial rights had a diplomatic dimension. There were answers to Cook and divergent opinions about commercial openness, but for today's purposes, Cook's be Cook became the proximate cause or the proximate source for Magna Carta and its meaning for two centuries afterward. That was true even outside of the British Empire. It's clear that Montesquieu read Cook's gloss on Magna Charta before uh, drafting uh, The Spirit of the Laws in 1748. A chunk of that treatise is a celebration of the English Constitution. And one example is the Frenchman's recapitulation of Cook's version of Chapter 30. 
The Magna Carta of England forbids the seizing and confiscating of the effects of foreign merchants during war, except by way of rep reprisals, Montesquieu wrote. It is an honor to the English nation that they have made this one of the articles of their liberty. Now, the PN came in the part of the book that famously uh, celebrates du commer. Commerce not only diffuses wealth, it destroy, destroys prejudice, softens manners, increases learning, and so on. Peace, Montesquieu declared, is the natural effect of trade. Um, here, Montesquieu moved beyond Cook's calculated and functional reciprocity. Uh, this was more of a utopian uh, sociability he had in mind. Um, it, the, the English had taken the lead. Other nations have made the interests of commerce yield to those of politics, he wrote. The English, on the other hand, have ever made their politics give way to commerce. Now, what did Montesquieu mean when he contrasted commerce and politics? And he's famously epigrammatic and inconsistent, but he could be read as suggesting that politics were national, jealous, leading toward belligerency. Commerce, on the other hand, was international, cosmopolitan, and followed the rational laws of the price system. It's a naive view, even by 18th century standards, the work of Yves von Hunt makes uh, very clear that there were debates within the Enlightenment about um, the so-called peace-promoting qualities of, of, of commerce. Nonetheless, Montesquieu broadcast one view of commerce and connected it to the English Constitution. He suggested that commerce should be insulated from politics or else it would become the prey of jealous statesmen. Fundamental political documents like Magna Carta and constitutions could help keep them in their separate spheres all the while somehow leaving room for uh, moderate regulation. So the point isn't, or not just, that Montesquieu had an overly cheery view of the English Constitution and the relationship between commerce and world peace. The point is that he made two distinctions that became increasingly important as the 18th century moved toward the 19th. First, he suggested a separation between commerce and politics. Next, he divided politics into constitutions on the one hand, and what governments did on a daily basis on the other. The ancient idea of fundamental law carried into the Enlightenment on the back of a theory that insulated commerce from politics. It wouldn't take much to start packing economic liberties into constitutional forms. And as people tried to do that, chapter 30 on the foreign merchants remained very much alive. When Blackston produced his own gloss on Magna Carta a decade or, or so later, um, he leaned heavily on Cook and Montesquieu. He observed that it was one thing for a nation to pledge reciprocity in treaties, uh, and another to promise it in a constitutional document. It's somewhat extraordinary, he wrote, that the re reciprocity principle should have found a place in Magna Carta, a mere interior treaty between the king and his own subjects. For Montesquieu and Blackston, chapter 30 be became a motor of progress. The barons and King John had moved civilization in the right direction, and their handiwork was made into something larger by these Enlightenment writers, trying to work out the complex relationship between law, commerce, and international relations. Now, the story of Magna Carta and the Enlightenment isn't just or primarily one about political philosophy and jurisprudence. Constitution makers debated lots of interesting ideas, of course, but they also manufactured institutions on the ground that had real consequences for actual people, like all those debtors and creditors whose networks were torn apart by the revolution and then patched together in a certain way by the Constitution, Congress, and the Supreme Court. So I don't claim that all the new constitutions in the Americas and Europe from 1776 to, say, 1830, contained protections for foreign merchants and credit. But many constitution makers, ratifiers, and readers across Europe and the Americas debated those issues. Some sought to open their economies from the foundation up. Others were more hesitant. The debates hardly ended when the constitutions got printed. And the ink was barely dry on the ratified federal constitution when proto-partisan debate began over how it should be applied to international commerce and finance. Now, the Brailsford case that I talked about a few minutes ago was only the third case argued in the new Supreme Court, and only the second followed through to judgment. Of course, the case only invoked the spirit, uh, not the letter, of Chapter 30. It involved debts rather than merchandise, and it involved uh, lenders who had never been in Georgia, or 
uh, not resident merchants, as in chapter 30. A chapter written for medieval resident merchants was refitted onto post-revolutionary uh, transatlantic credit networks. Um, and here is elsewhere in one of the great themes of early American constitutional, the imperial was translated into the international. In the Brailsford case, the court used the reciprocity principle of chapter 30 to help find that Georgia hadn't confiscated the debt. And two years later, in another debt case, the court decided that overseas creditors could recover debts even when the revolutionary states had obviously and totally confiscated those debts. That case required an aggressive interpretation of the Treaty of Peace's article on legal impediments. Uh, and although no one there cited chapter 30, several lawyers noted that Britain had not confiscated American debt during the war. Implicitly, they argued, the states had violated the reciprocity principle. And explicitly, they argued, the peace treaty had reversed that mistake. Now, uh, the extension and elaboration of chapter 30 in Brailsfield, uh, Brailsford can't stand for the proposition that uh, foreign merchants always won in the early United States. At about the same time the court decided Brailsfield, it also decided Chisholm versus Georgia, also, versus, uh, also a case involving the rogue state of, uh, fascinating state of Georgia. Um, when, uh, and that case held that uh, uh, individuals could sue the states directly in the Supreme Court. And it led to the 11th Amendment uh, forbidding that is, suits against states in the Supreme Court, unless the state had consented. But it's interesting, the, the, uh, uh, and I'll wrap up here, the, mo the momentum for the 11th Amendment didn't begin right after Chisholm. There was some grumbling. It began a year later when Brailsford was handed down, and Georgia put two and two together and realized if uh, uh, foreign citizens, including foreign British creditors, could sue um, Georgia in federal court, they, they certainly could reopen all of the confiscations and all the states that had confiscated British property during the war, which is every single state, realized that uh, cases that they had thought had been settled 10, 20 years earlier could be reopened in the federal courts and who knows how they would be decided. So the, the 11th Amendment forbade uh, suits by, uh, against the states directly. Um, nonetheless, there's a lot of uh, uh, debate in uh, surrounding not just in case, not in just in judicial cases but in the political arena about the rights of foreign creditors in the mid 1790s and in these cases and elsewhere you start to see uh, what, I, what I would call the constitutional arguments uh, in favor of capitalism as it was about to triumph so thanks very much <laughs>